ഇന്നിവിടെ കൂടിയിരിക്കുന്നത് ഡോക്ടർ എം മുരളീധരൻ വാഷിൻ്റെ രണ്ടായിരത്തി ഇരുപത്തിനാലിലെ മെമ്മോറിയൽ ലെക്ചർ അത് വി ഹാവ് ബീൻ വെരി ഓണേഡ് ആൻഡ് പ്രിവിലേജ് ടു ഹാവ് പ്രൊഫസർ എം വി നാരായണൻ വിത്ത് ആ സ്റ്റുഡി ടു ഡെലിവർ ദിസ് ലെക്ചർ ഹിസ് എമിനൻസ് സ്കോളർഷിപ്പ് ആൻഡ് കമ്മിറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ടു സ്പീക്കിംഗ് ട്രൂത്ത് ടു പവർ ഹാസ് ഓൾവേസ് ബീൻ എൻ ഇൻസ്പിറേഷൻ ടു ഓൾ ഓഫ് എസ് ആൻഡ് ഐ ഹോപ്പ് വി ഹി കണ്ടിന്യൂസ് ടു ഡു ദാറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഡ്യൂറിംഗ് എ ടൈം ഇൻ ഹിസ്റ്ററി വെൻ മെജോറിറ്റേറിയൻ റിജീംസ് ആ ക്രാക്കിംഗ് ഡൗൺ ഓൺ സ്പേസസ് ഓഫ് ഫ്രീ തിങ്കിങ് സ്പിരിറ്റ്സ് ഓഫ് ഡെമോക്രസി ആൻഡ് ഡിസെൻറ്റ് ഐ ഓൾസോ യൂസ് ദിസ് ഓപ്പർച്യൂണിറ്റി ടു എക്സ്റ്റെൻഡ് അവർ അൺകണ്ടീഷണൽ സോളിഡാരിറ്റി ടു പ്രൊഫസർ എം വി നാരായണൻ ഐ മസ്റ്റ് ഓൾസോ താങ്ക് അവർ ഫോമർ പ്രൊഫസേഴ്സ് സനൽ സർ രാജുമാഷൻ കെ എം കൃഷ്ണൻ സർ ഫോർ ജോയിനിങ് എസ് ടു ഡി വി ഹാവ് ഹാവ് ദ ഓപ്പർച്യൂണിറ്റി ടു ബി കോൺസ്റ്റൻലി മെൻറ്റേഡ് ആൻഡ് യു നോ വി ആർ റിമൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് ദ വിഷൻ ദാറ്റ് ദിസ് പ്ലേസ് ഹോൾഡ്സ് ആൻഡ് ഇൻ അവർ ലിറ്റിൽ വേസ് ടു കണ്ടിന്യൂ ദാറ്റ് ഫോർവേഡ് ഇൻ അഗെയിൻ ദ ലിമിറ്റേഷൻസ് ദാറ്റ് വി ഹാവ് ഇൻ ടേംസ് ഓഫ് സ്കോളർഷിപ്പ് ആൻഡ് അക്കാഡമിക് ആൻഡ് ഇൻ്റലക്ച്വൽ പോസിബിലിറ്റീസ് ദാറ്റ് ദേ ഹാഡ് ഹെൽത്ത് അറ്റ് വൺ പോയിൻ്റ് ഇൻ ടൈം ഇൻ ഹിസ്റ്ററി ആൻഡ് ഐ ഡോ ഐ എം ഐ എം ഷുവർ ദാറ്റ് ഐ ഡോ ഹാവ് Uh, the capacity to offer a formal welcome to professor mv narayanan but still uh, we have all uh, read his eminent work especially the most recent work uh, which came out in 2022 space time and uh, ways of seeing the performance culture of uh, kudi atom and his excellent scholarship uh, in the fields of cultural studies theater and performance studies and uh, traditional indian theater so i i i'm i'm pretty sure that it doesn't need a formal introduction from my end but i must say that i have always been inspired by the kind of scholarship he has produced more so the honest and bold way in which an intellectual must stand uh, especially during such moments of crisis so i have drawn inspiration and drawn courage from him and i'm sure all of uh, you sitting here as well have done that and i encourage all of you to go back to uh, scholarship perhaps that's only way in which we can deal with such times in history without much ado i'd like to welcome him to the stage but Uh, in terms of formality i think i must also thank the students of school of social sciences we have had an eventful nack and your collective efforts have helped us do some justice to what we could do and i hope you all continue their enthusiasm not just with administrative uh, efforts but also academic endeavors in the times to come forward and i also thank my faculty colleagues here as well as the staff and other members of uh, the school of social sciences for gathering here today and also the guests who have joined us from outside the school uh, without delaying much i welcome all of you to this uh, lecture today and in uh, in memory of uh, dr m murlidharan and his family thank you so much adhyaksha prasangathinai rajesh komath maashine kshanikunu ഡോക്ടർ എം മുരളീധരൻ മെമ്മോറിയൽ ലെക്ചറും എം ഗോവിന്ദൻ മെമ്മോറിയൽ ലെക്ചറും സ്കൂൾ ഓഫ് സോഷ്യൽ സയൻസസ് കൃത്യമായി നടത്തുന്ന രണ്ട് പ്രധാന ലെക്ചേഴ്സാണ് ഇവിടെ ഡോക്ടർ എം മുരളീധരനെ മുരളി മാഷിനെ ഇവിടെ പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തുക എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ എനിക്കും വ്യക്തിപരമായി പരിചയമില്ലാത്തിരുന്ന ഒരാളാണ് അദ്ദേഹം ഞാനിവിടെ വരുമ്പോൾ അദ്ദേഹം ഇവിടെ ഫാക്കൽറ്റി അല്ലായിരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹം അമ്മയെ വിട്ടുപിരിഞ്ഞിരുന്നു ഈ അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ഒരു ദൈക്ഷണിക തലം ഈ സ്കൂൾ ഓഫ് സോഷ്യൽ സയൻസിനെ സംബന്ധിച്ചിടത്തോളം അതിനെ കൂട്ടിയിണക്കുന്ന ഏറ്റവും വലിയ ഒരു കണ്ണിയാണ് എന്ന് നമുക്ക് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ വർക്കുകളിലൂടെ ഒന്ന് നോക്കുമ്പോൾ മനസ്സിലാവും ഉപനിഷത്തിനെ കുറിച്ചുള്ള ഒരു പുസ്തകം അദ്ദേഹം എഴുതിയിട്ടുണ്ട് അത് ഏറ്റവും പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ഒരു ഒരു തീസിസാണ് അതിലുപരിയായിട്ട് ഞാൻ ഇപ്പം മുരളിമാഷയുടെ ഈ മെമ്മോറിയൽ ലെക്ചറുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ഏറ്റവും പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ഒരു 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 ലേഖനം ഹിന്ദു കമ്മ്യൂണലൈസേഷനെക്കുറിച്ച് ഉള്ള കമ്മ്യൂണലൈസേഷൻ്റെ ഒരു ഡിബേറ്റിൽ വരുന്നത് അതിൽ ഒരുപക്ഷെ വർത്തമാന ഇന്ത്യയിൽ 
നമ്മളിപ്പോൾ എന്താണോ കാണുന്നത് അതിൻ്റെ ഒരു നേർ ചിത്രം ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി തൊണ്ണൂറ്റി മൂന്നിൽ എഴുതിയ ലേഖനത്തിൽ വളരെ സവിസ്തരിച്ച് പ്രതിപാദിക്കുന്നത് കാണാം അതിൽ ഞാൻ നേരത്തെ വായിച്ചിട്ടുള്ളതാണ് പക്ഷെ ഒന്നും കൂടി അത് ഇന്നലെ ഒന്നും എടുത്ത് വായിക്കാൻ എനിക്ക് തോന്നി അപ്പോൾ അതിൽ രസകരമായിട്ടുള്ള ചില ഘട്ടങ്ങൾ ഇന്ത്യൻ ജനാധിപത്യത്തിൻ്റെ ഘട്ടങ്ങൾ കമ്മ്യൂണലൈസേഷൻ്റെ ഘട്ടങ്ങൾ അതിൽ പറയുന്നുണ്ട് അതിൽ ഏറ്റവും പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ടതെന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഇലീറ്റ് എക്സ്ട്രീമിസ്റ്റുകളായിട്ട് ആദ്യം തുടങ്ങിയ കമ്മ്യൂണൽ ഫോഴ്സസ് ഒരു മോഡറേറ്റ് എക്സ്ട്രീമിസ്റ്റായിട്ട് ഒരു പ്രത്യേക ഘട്ടത്തിൽ മാറുകയും അതിനുശേഷം മാസ് എക്സ്ട്രീമിസം എന്ന രീതിയിൽ ഇന്ന് വർത്തമാനകാലത്തൊക്കെ കാണുന്ന ഒരു ഹിന്ദുത്വ ഫോഴ്സസിൻ്റെ വരവിനെ അതിൻ്റെ ഒരു ജെ ഒരു ജീനിയോളജി വളരെ സസൂക്ഷ്മം ട്രേസ് ചെയ്യുന്നതായിട്ട് നമുക്ക് കാണാം അതിൽ ഗുഡ് ഹിന്ദൂസ് ആൻഡ് ബാഡ് മുസ്ലിംസ് എന്നൊരു ഒരു പ്രയോഗമുണ്ട് ദ മേക്കിംഗ് ഓഫ് ഗുഡ് ഹിന്ദൂസ് ആൻഡ് ബാഡ് മുസ്ലിംസ് ഇത് ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി തൊണ്ണൂറ്റി രണ്ടിലെ ബാബരി മസ്ജിദത്തിന് ശേഷമായിരിക്കും പ്രധാനമായിട്ടും ഈ ഒരു തോട്ട് ഉണ്ടാവുകയും അത് സസൂക്ഷ്മം വിശദീകരിക്കുന്നതോടൊപ്പം വളരെ കമ്മ്യൂണൽ ഫോഴ്സസിൻ്റെ ഒരു വർക്കിങ്ങിനെ കുറിച്ച് വളരെ അതിൻ്റെ സ്വഭാവം എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ അത് രേഖപ്പെടുത്തിയിട്ടല്ല പലപ്പോഴും വർക്ക് ചെയ്യുന്നത് കമ്മ്യൂണൽ ഫോഴ്സിൻ്റെ ഒരു ലീഡർ ആഹ്വാനം ചെയ്യുന്ന ചില അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ആഹ്വാനം ചെയ്യുന്ന ചില പദ്ധതികൾ ഒന്നും തന്നെ ഒരു ജനാധിപത്യ പാർട്ടികൾ ചെയ്യുന്നത് പോലെയോ ഒക്കെ രേഖപ്പെടുത്തിയോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അത് പ്രഖ്യാപിച്ചിട്ടോ അല്ല അങ്ങനെ സൂക്ഷ്മമായി സീക്രസിയോടുകൂടി ചെയ്യുന്നതാണ് ഒരു ഡിക്റ്റീവ് സ്വഭാവം പലപ്പോഴും ഈ കമ്മ്യൂണൽ ഫോഴ്സസിന് ഉണ്ടെന്നും അത് പ്രത്യേക തരത്തിൽ പാസ്റ്റിനെ മാനുഫാക്ചർ ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നു എന്നുള്ളതാണ് അല്ലൊരു അത് പറയുമ്പോൾ ഒരു ഏറ്റവും രസമായിട്ട് എനിക്ക് തോന്നിയിട്ടുള്ളൊരു കാര്യം ഈ ദേശീയ പ്രസ്ഥാനങ്ങളുടെ കാര്യങ്ങളൊന്നുമല്ല നമുക്ക് നമ്മുടെ പാസ്റ്റായിട്ട് പലപ്പോഴും വർത്തമാന കാലത്തിൽ എപ്പിയർ ചെയ്യപ്പെടുന്നത് മറിച്ച് മുഗൾ പിരീഡും അല്ലെങ്കിൽ മിഡീവൽ ഫ്യൂഡൽ ജാതി ബോധങ്ങളുടെയൊക്കെ ഒരു ക ആ കാലമാണ് യഥാർത്ഥത്തിൽ വർത്തമാന ചരിത്രമായിട്ട് നമ്മൾ വായിക്കുന്നത് എന്ന രീതിയിലും അതുകൊണ്ട് മാനുഫാക്ചറിങ് ഓഫ് പാസ്റ്റ് എന്ന് പറയുന്നൊരു ഒരു കാര്യം അദ്ദേഹം വളരെ സൗജന്യം അപ്പോൾ കണ്ടംപററി പിന്നെ തേർഡ് വേൾഡ് ഫാസിസത്തെക്കുറിച്ച് നമ്മൾ പഠിക്കുന്ന വായിക്കുന്ന ആലോചനകളിലും അതോടൊപ്പം തന്നെ ഇന്ത്യയിൽ ഇന്ന് വർത്തമാന കാലത്ത് നടക്കുന്ന വളരെയധികം ഫോഴ്സ്ഫുള്ളായിട്ടുള്ള ഹിന്ദുത്വ കമ്മ്യൂണലൈസേഷൻ പോലുള്ള കാര്യങ്ങൾ മതത്തെ അടിസ്ഥാനപ്പെടുത്തിയ ഒരു ദേശവുമൊക്കെ നിർവചിക്കുകയും നിർവചിക്കുക മാത്രമല്ല അതൊരു പ്രാക്ടീസായി വരികയൊക്കെ ചെയ്തിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു ഘട്ടത്തെ വളരെ സസൂക്ഷ്മം അത് ഒരു സമ്പദ്ശാസ്ത്ര രാഷ്ട്രീയ സമ്പദ്ശാസ്ത്രവും സാംസ്കാരിക വിശകലനവും നടത്തുന്ന ഏറ്റവും പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട നമ്മളെല്ലാവരും വർത്തമാന കാലത്ത് വായിക്കേണ്ടുന്ന ഒരു പുസ്തകം എന്ന ഒരു ലേഖനം എന്ന രീതിയിൽ ഞാൻ ഈ സമയത്ത് ഓർക്കുകയാണ് ഇത്രയും പറഞ്ഞുകൊണ്ട് രണ്ടായിരത്തി ഇരുപത്തിനാല് മെമ്മോറിയൽ ലെക്ചർ ഡോക്ടർ എം മുരളീധരൻ മെമ്മോറിയൽ ലെക്ചർ നടത്താൻ വേണ്ടി നമ്മുടെ ക്ഷണം സ്വീകരിച്ച് യാതൊരു ഉപേക്ഷയും ഇല്ലാതെ ഒരു ദിവസം പോലും നാളെ മാറ്റിവെക്കാതെ നമ്മൾ പറയുമ്പോൾ തന്നെ അത് സ്വീകരിക്കുകയും സന്തോഷത്തോടുകൂടി അത് സ്വീകരിക്കുമെന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾക്കും അറിയാം കാരണം മുരളി മാഷു ആയിട്ടുള്ള എല്ലാ വ്യക്തിപരമായ ബന്ധങ്ങൾ ഉള്ള ആൾക്കാരാണ് നമ്മുടെ മുമ്പിൽ ഇവിടെ ഇരിക്കുന്നത് രാജു മാഷ് സരൽ മാഷ് കൃഷ്ണൻ മാഷ് ഇവരെല്ലാവർക്കും അവരെല്ലാവരും സുഹൃത്തുക്കളായിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു ഒരു കാര്യമാണ് അതുകൊണ്ട് അധ്യക്ഷ പ്രസംഗം വരെ അധിക പ്രസംഗമായി മാറാതിരിക്കാൻ ഞാൻ ശ്രമിക്കുകയാണ് എല്ലാ ആദരവോടും കൂടി ആർക്കൈവിങ് ദ പ്രസൻറ്റ് ഇൻ എ ടൈം ഔട്ട് ഓഫ് ജോയിൻറ്റ് എന്ന പ്രബന്ധം ലെക്ചർ അവതരിപ്പിക്കാൻ വേണ്ടി കാലടി യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിൽ വൈസ് ചാൻസലർ പ്രൊഫസർ എം വി നാരായണ മാഷെ ക്ഷണിച്ചോളും ഇത് 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Shilpa, for those nice words, and thank you, Rajesh, for those introductory remarks about Dr. Mudlikaran. It's definitely not an easy task to hold a memorial lecture deliver a memorial lecture, especially when the person one is remembering happens to be not just a friend, but someone who has played a huge role in one's own intellectual life. Murali was, at that point of time in my life, when my priorities or my inclinations were not entirely clear, a significant, substantive, not just influence, the presence, probably not in a continuous manner, but in a manner which made deep marks in the way in which I thought and the way in which I wrote and the way in which I understood reality. It would be no exaggeration to say that along with T.K. Ramachandran, Murali was one of the most brilliant people that Kerala ever produced. Brilliance not merely in terms of academic or scholarly output, but brilliance in terms of being able to understand their present, with such clarity that right now it appears to, to us that they were indeed speaking with some kind of clairvoyance about the future. There are two distinct memories that I have that I think I should share with you about Murali, both of which are at one and the same time personal, but also quite political. The first is somewhat of a, an anecdote. Murali used to come to TK Ramajandran's house, and TK who was so prolific in his speaking, one could never stop him speaking. But when Murali was there, when Murali was there, TK would become tongue-tied or even sometimes lost for words. It's one of the few times that one sees TK Ramayandran being a listener and not a speaker. And that's what And that's when Murali is in his presence. So, a couple of months or a few months before, Murli was admitted to hospital with his heart condition. Murli happened to visit TK in his Calicut home, and we were all together in the evening there. And there was a poster up on the, on the wall which said, if work is the greatest thing on earth, I'd rather try Mars. Bhumila Joliana Eto and Gambira and the Lingle Yan Mars Trikatalaki Popola in the Uru Poster on Dairo. TK's partner at that time, Dr. Geeta, had played a little joke 
and stricken the heirs and replaced it with X. If work is the greatest thing on earth, I'll rather try Marx. That was a little bit of a joke on Marxists, on armchair Marxists, who speak eloquently about the value of work, but probably one can never find them doing even a minute of valuable work. We all laughed at that, but then Murali proceeded to speak, taking up the category work, and he said, there are basically four categories with which you can look at almost the entirety of philosophy, where these four categories come in, shift, one becomes predominant, the other becomes predominant later, there is an overlap between two of them. These four categories, according to him, were activity, work, labor, play. Starting from Plato, Murali sat there and spoke about at each point or each stage in the process of Western philosophy as well as Indian philosophy, you find one of these categories or one of these concepts becoming more important and then giving way to another one. Activity is that which distinguishes living organism from a non-living one. Work is that which distinguishes the human being, the non-human beings in that it is directed towards some object, some result. But labor is productive work. And play is something that enters into each and every one of them, making it possible for people to do work or do labor, but at the same time, sometimes, with the threat of subverting the work or subverting that labor, the pleasure principle, so to speak. And according to Murali, what has happened from the 1950s onwards is that the category of play has become much more important within theory and within philosophy, so much so that if you look at Derrida, if you look at Lacan, or if you start from Freud onwards, you find this overwhelming emphasis upon the aspect of play. Malayalatile krida in the world. Radhi in the world in the world. Kali in the world. So, it was, a, it was a very interesting, he spoke for three hours about this. We sat there and listened to him. Because it was a fresh intake, a fresh take on a history of philosophy through the lens of four categories. In one way, it was also a demonstration of Murali's erudition, firm grasp of the entire theoretical domain, while at the same time, he was also demonstrating his ability to look at things in terms of variable perspectives, not being fixed in any one of them. Now, the second memory I have is about a conference that was held in Calicut, where it was part of, I think, the, uh, the CPM's uh, conclave, where EMS Nambudri part was also there. And Murli was making a presentation with EMS sitting in front of him. And Murli spoke about an inversion in the way in which we see communalism and violence. Generally speaking, we understand violence as a product of communalism, as a product of some communal friction. And we say that a particular kind of fracas that has happened somewhere a conflict that has happened somewhere is invariably the result of the communal tensions that are existing at that particular point of time, that place. But Murali's contention was that no violence is spontaneous. 
that all violence is engineered. And that violence, far from being a result of communalism, is a causation, the causative force, the defective cause through which the feelings of communalism are actually generated in the minds of people, making it possible to turn it into an ideology and create the formation of a community. I still remember him speak in probably the simplest of terms about high, how identity is a constructed. When there is a conflict between a Hindu and a Muslim, that happens right in front of your eyes, or that you witness on TV, or that you read about in the newspaper, it is at that point of time that you ask yourself the question, am I a Hindu or am I a Muslim? In those terms, the acts of violence are not merely results, offshoots, but actually they are engineered in such a fashion that they can create ripples in the minds of the subjects who are around these incidents and receive them and in response realize or being made to realize in a very constructed manner, in a very engineered manner, in an engineered context, their own identities leading to the formation of communities. I just mentioned these two incidents because this is the way that Murali thought. His contribution to Kalavi Marsham, especially his critique of uh, M. Govindan, his contributions in the study of the Upanishads, and the way in which, through his speeches and lectures, he popularized how it made it possible for people here to understand contemporary theory from the Marxist canon, as well as the non-Marxist canon. He used to have this rather jocular response when someone who has not read Althusa comes and speaks on Althusa, he would say, and the prayer Because he has written about Althusa and he has read that and he speaks about Althusa. That is my ghost, he used to say. There was a generosity of spirit that one probably do not find so much with intellectuals. He was not creating a name for himself. He was not bothered about that. He had the temerity, he had the guts to speak truth to power. When a vice chancellor, Raju will be able to say that when a vice chancellor visited the School of Social Sciences and there were only two computers available here, one which will be completely dominated by Nizar and the other by Murali. Nizar will be on that drawing pictures of Ganapati and Murali will be playing games. And then this vice chancellor, it appears, asked Murali, is this what we are being paid for? And Murli said, you don't pay me for what, I, for what I do. You pay me for what I am. Now that is a statement that very few people today will be able to make. You pay me for what I am, not for what I do. I don't want to dwell further on Murli. Even today, it is with a heavy heart that I can remember because these memories which, in a manner of speaking, I bring back with a tone of nostalgia are also memories tinged with pain and a sense of loss. A loss not just for his friends, but a loss for Kerala and a loss for India and a loss for the world of the intellect. But at the same time, at the same time, I can only think that they are fortunate, PK and Murali, that they departed before they saw their own prognostications of the future coming true right in front of their eyes. And we are here left to see that and to ruminate on what they said about what was going to happen. Yeah. 
my lecture today somewhat in keeping with Murli's work and in respect to what he considered one of the major strands of his intellectual life, the combating of communalism. My lecture is titled Archiving the Present in a Time Out of Joy. Let me start with the end of that title. Time out of joint is a Shakespearean phrase. A phrase that Hamlet utters when he tries to describe the state of Denmark. When he returns from England to Denmark, he finds that his father is dead, the victim of a violent crime, and his uncle has already ascended the throne, that he has married his own mother, and slowly but steadily indications come in that his uncle himself is responsible for the murder of his father. And that's why at one point of time, Hamlet says, there is something rotten in the state of Denmark. And that rottenness, or that rot, to so, so to speak, is what he describes by the term time out of joint, a time that does not belong together, a time that is described by a deep schism, a time that leaves one with a sense of dread or a sense of threat. I would believe that that's the kind of time that we are living in today. I shall not go into details about that till the end of the lecture. But the first part of the title, Archiving the Present, can at best be described as a contradiction or even something that verges on an oxymoron. Because archives, conventionally speaking, are always to do with the past. We connect it with the past. And we connect it with the past not only because the archives that we work with, the archives that we consider as archives, are invariably vestiges of the past, records of the past, in various forms, in diverse media. But invariably, they are bakhi batrangal in the barayin nadirila. They are that which is left of the past. But within this association with the past, the idea that archives are to do with the past, there is also a false etymology lurking within that. And that false etymology comes from the assumption that the arc or the archi in archive refers to the beginning or the original principle as you find in a term called archaeology. Ancient times. Archaeology in that sense comes from the Greek term archaeos, ancient, or archaea, ancient things. And in parallel with that, most often it is considered that archives are to do with the past, archaea, things of the past. But in actuality, the word archive comes from Latin archivum, or archiva, or archaea, which refers to the Greek word archaea, meaning public records, and arche from the government. This is the arche of autocracy, of oligarchy, of such archies, the form of government, of governance. The arche here in archive derives its sense from archiva, which means public records, or archaea, which means public records, which has its connections with arche, which means government. In both Greek as well as Latin, the word archon meant the dwelling of a magistrate, the residence of a magistrate, where public records used to be kept, they used to be protected there, and as a result, by extension, that which is held in that place 
came to be called as an archive. But despite this false etymology, as I said, definitely in practice, we always see archives as something to do with the past. The International Council of Archives now defines archives as the documentary product of human activity retained for their long-term value. There is a connotation of the past inside that too. The documentary product of human activity retained for their long-term value. They come in a range of formats, written, photographic, audiovisual, in digital or analog form. Archives are maintained by public and private organizations around the world. Therefore, archives are a real-time reflection of the activity of individuals and organizations, and they provide a view of past events. Even the International Council of Archives has fallen prey to the false etymology and considers archives as that which records the past and provides us with a direct view of the past. Now, what archives really do, and I'm sure as social science students, this doesn't require any reiteration. It is basically their long-term historical value, something that survives beyond the immediate time and place of their production, and where that value is assessed, both in terms of being able to provide understandings, interpretations of the time that they belong to, in terms of the perspectives of the present, where you bring upon those archives a certain strategy or model of interpretation through which a certain kind of reality is uncovered. But the most important thing about archives at the same time is that archives are never considered as consciously created historical records. The writing of history is different from the archive because what you write using an archive is a history where you have a conscious understanding that you're writing a narrative of the past, a story of the past, an interpretation of the past, while the archives do not probably say such a story. They are evidences of what happened in the past in terms of correspondences, in terms of documentary evidence, in terms of visual or other kinds of evidence. And so the value of an archive or archives stem in part from the contemporary nature and the insight that they can give us into specific historical moments. They are windows into historical moments, but windows which need to be opened. And how you open them depends on the kind of theoretical, methodological model that you use in order to open them. Or in other words, if it appears to be an object out there, it throws up or it gives up meaning in terms of the lens that you use or the perspective with which you actually employ that particular set of archives. Now, what, I'm, what I've till now basically said is that I'm wrong, that I'm speaking not of an archive of the past, but an archive of the present. Even as this idea of the archive has been there throughout. There has been one strand within the entire domain of archive itself, which has steadfastly refused to be incorporated into this modeling of the past and where archives are seen as something which address and represent the present. They are chronicles. There again, there is a problem. Chronicles are also again considered to be narratives of the past. Historically speaking, most chronicles that have been written, whether they be in the West or in the East or in different parts of the world, 
they are narratives of the past. What happened in the past? Take Hollinshed's Chronicles, for example, the famous source for Shakespeare's plays. Don't you find it rather strange that Shakespeare has not written even one single play where the story is his own? So much for our ideas of novelty and creativity. None of his plays are written based on a story that he himself has created. But today, we consider creativity as something to do with novelty. It was a very different idea of creativity at that point of time. But I digress now. Hollinshed's Chronicles was something that was formulated over more than a century, where one by one different people compiled the histories of England, Scotland, and Wales, primarily in terms of the royal personages who actually ruled over these lands and their stories and their doings in terms of what one would call the attempt at a royal history. The word history wasn't there at that point of time, or the word history as we understand it today wasn't employed at that point of time, and they were called chronicles, primarily because they followed the chronological order of events and the chronological order of personages. Fundamentally speaking, Hollinshed's chronicles, and most other chronicles for that matter, were attempts, were a version of the past, which in one way or another were attempts at legitimizing or attempts at legitimation of an existing power structure, a certain royal personage or a certain regime or a certain kind of and chronicles invariably what they did was to connect this particular royal power that was existing at a point of time to an earlier narrative so that there is a connection between uh, a continuous connection, so to speak, between the beginning to this point of time. If you look at chronicles in India, you find that invariably when a new regime comes to power, a new royal regime starts, there is a Vamshavali that is created. A Vamshavali which will take this person who's probably the son of a commoner or who personally came in from some place in the Middle Eastern regions and then established his power here, suddenly you find him being able to trace a lineage back to the Surya Vamsha or to the Chandra Vamsha. There is a Vamshavali that is created. Chronicles in that sense are versions of the past, are interpretations of the past, but they have very contemporary undertones, where they are legitimations of the present, and where, in a manner of speaking, there is a curious admixture of reality and fiction, or where the difference between history and myth is rather tenuous, and where the overlap between history and myth seems to be a very comfortable solution for the attempts at legitimation. Though this is the case, what we find is a curious twist from what one would call the beginnings of modernity in Europe, where chronicles came to be written. Another thing about those chronicles is that they were invariably written under the patronage of a royal power or under the express instruction by a royal power or an aristocrat. When you look at Rome, for example, the stories connected with the papacy, the chronicles connected with the papacy, the chronicles connected with the Roman emperors, invariably were official records, in inverted commas, official records that were sponsored by the regime or the royal personage who was ruling over Rome at that point of time, and which invariably presented these people in the best light possible as if they were Caesars. They were indeed Caesars, so to speak. But from the late Middle Ages, well into the 19th century, a very curious thing happened, especially in Germany, in Austria, in Netherlands, or what is right now Netherlands, 
where a remarkable number of middle class men across Europe started chronicling current events in their communities and beyond, creating a very hybrid type of non-institutional archive, non-official archive, non-royal archive that were both local and personal. Such texts, which were written by commoners, people like tanners, doctors or apothecaries, lower officials, people who worked with wood and iron, but who were literate, and that's the most important issue here. They were literate. They knew the alphabet. They knew how to write. Such texts, the most important feature about them is that they were never printed during their lifetime. One has to realize here that probably the greatest, shall I say, step forward in the domain of knowledge, when you consider that as the invention of the printing press, and when the availability of the printing press was there, making it possible for Hollinshed's chronicles and the other chronicles to be available, generally speaking, to public at large, and which later led to, at a later point of time, the creation of newspapers and little pamphlets, etc., which could be published and read by the public at large. These chronicles were not public, so to speak. They were kind of private. They used to be circulated among friends, among family, but they were always circulated in handwritten form. This, these were handwritten archa, handwritten chronicles, which were rarely printed in their lifetime, but they circulated in the localities and were frequently read and importantly continued by others. What you find among these chronicles is that one person may start it, but in due course of time, after his passing, his son may continue, or his cousin may continue that. And after his passing, someone else belonging to the next generation may continue that. In effect, these were chronicles which spanned several generations, continuously being added to in a cumulative fashion, providing us with a picture or a series of pictures of an experiential reality underwent by the people of that time, common people. Some places had a very strong chronicling tradition of this kind. Cities such as Augsburg and Nuremberg in Germany, Bristol and Norwich in England, Valencia and Barcelona in Spain, etc. Where, especially in France, these chronicles were continued through successive generations. Now, it is also interesting that while these chronicles were on very different things, there was a diversity, a huge diversity in the subject matter of these chronicles. But each chronicle was somewhat specialized in that even as they passed through the generations, the focus of the chronicle remained some, most often the same. If a chronicle basically had to do with the experience of war and the aftermath of war, that chronicle will continue with that. If a chronicle addressed local realities, like the changes of cities in terms of infrastructure, in terms of roads, in terms of buildings, that chronicle would continue that through successive generations. It was so, in a manner of speaking, a specialized kind of narrative which addressed different niches, different spaces, different locations within the experiential reality of the people of the time. Now, Judith Fallman, a historian, in an article called, I'm plagiarizing, archiving the present, and chronicling for the future in early modern Europe, she speaks about this link or this method of writing about the contemporary times, about their own times, in terms of a connection 
with the future. She points out a few very interesting details about why and how these chronicles came to be written. One major feature is that these chronicles invariably always came up at junctures of huge change, transformation. And what can be the worst kind of transformation but war. The Thirty Years' War, the Seven Years' War, all of which convulsed Europe and created rapid and radical transformations in the social fabric, in the systems of governance, in city, in urban and rural life. These were the points that most of these chronicles started from. So she said, there is a very clear correlation between the years of war and crisis and the keeping of chronicles. I'm quoting again. In Germany, both the Thirty Years' War and the Seven Years' War saw peaks in chronicling activity. In the Dutch Republic, the crisis years, 1747 to 1749, 1780 to 1813, during which time there was huge changes in the governance structures, all generated many new chronicles. Now, in that sense, revolutionary change, changes brought in by war, changes brought in through regime changes, changes brought in by modernity. There is one chronicle in which a person meticulously documents the changes that are happening to the cityscape and how old buildings are getting torn down day by day and new ugly structures in inverted commas are being built up in order to create new cities. The irony being that it is those ugly structures that we look back today and find to be very beautiful. But for them, at that point of time, those new buildings were ugly structures which replaced the aesthetic earlier buildings. Now, what was the idea? What was the propelling, motivating force that compelled these ordinary people to write about their experience, about what was happening around them, especially in these periods of change? Several people have come up with several kinds of possibilities. Some people say that by documenting disorder and discontinuity, the war chroniclers were showing that they shared a concern for order and continuity. You know, in literature we usually say that when you write, when you write about utopia, it is not just a hope for utopia, it is a critique of the dystopia in which you are living that prompts you to write about utopia. So when they are writing about crisis, about disorder and discontinuity, it is an inner urge, a desire for continuity and order that probably propels them. Some other historians have suggested that these texts were attempts by these subjects to create or come up with some grip on the complexities of the situation in which they were finding themselves. That the soil under their feet was shifting. That the realities that they were used to was no longer the same. They were changing. What was going to happen tomorrow, what is going to happen day after, was something that they couldn't entirely predict. And in a manner trying to understand themselves and their position within this fluctuating, changing world, they tried to document their reality so that they can get a grip on what was happening. Now, some historians have actually, or historiographers, have actually commented that this desire for order and the attempt to grip something, hold it fast, hold it there stable, is also a desire for the continuation of existing power relations. That it was an attempt to look critically at that which was coming 
and substantiating that which was getting lost in the process. But a cross-section, a larger cross-section of the Chronicles will make it clear that this, that this is too simplistic a kind of depiction. Because a chronicler served to confirm all literate men in their sense of local importance and making them the arbiters of what was useful and perhaps even true knowledge. It was not entirely on the sides of the existing power structure or partisan to the existing power structure. Such tendencies may have been inbuilt in these chronicles in some cases, but in several other cases, it was also a sympathy for what was coming up, what the changes were foreboding. Looking at it totally, one can say that there are three major aspects to these chronicles. Number one, as I already said, they are written by ordinary people. People who till that point of time in history had no pretensions to scholarship, no pretensions or any claims on history, but who at a certain point of time suddenly realized for themselves that they had something to write down. And which writing down could be circulated among people, among their peers, among people who belong to the same class or the same community, and which would help them to understand their own reality. The second thing, as I said before, was that they were not printed, they were not public in the full sense of the term, they were semi-private or semi-public, private in the sense that they were circulated in private circles. But much more important than any of these is another aspect that they were conscious narratives, that those were conscious that they were recording a contemporary reality, an experiential reality that they were going through. And this is very important. They are conscious of creating an archive. It is not just a chronicle. They're conscious of creating an archive, and when they are documenting a reality, sometimes assisted also with graphic representations of buildings, etc., they were conscious that they were creating an archive. It is not something that they did as part of another activity. Padmanabha Swami Kshetratile, Ella Dosum Kanakiridi. themselves. <laughs> Their intention was not something outside of themselves, but their intentions were themselves, in the sense that they were writing conscious, if not histories, chronicles, they were creating conscious archives. And this is why that in 1958, Henry Schmidt observes that this kind of chronicles usually does not have knowledge of the past as its objective does not have knowledge of the past as its objective. It records events when they have happened and fixes them. It writes them into a future. It rise, writes to make their presence felt. I think this is a brilliant, brilliant comment. Because what you find in them, this particular comment is that, he is not writing about the chroniclers. He is writing about the chronicling, about the activity, the practice of writing chronicles. And keeping aside the subject, he is talking about an activity that is conscious in itself. And so that consciousness is not a knowledge of the past, but a knowledge of the present. It records, that is the chronicle, records events when they have happened and fixes them into a present in terms of other connections with other aspects of the present and it writes them into a future. 
for a future into a future, it rides to make their presence last so that ultimately speaking, that they were not printed, were not any sense of inferiority of these narratives, but that the primary intention behind these chronicles were not that they should be read by the contemporaries, that they should be read by succeeding generations, people who came later. There were records of the present written for the sake of the future. Now, in this sense, we will be able to understand these early modern chronicles better if we treat them as collections of useful knowledge that were archived for the deployment in the future. For deployment in what way? We will come to that. Deployment in the future to assess the significance and meaning of new events and developments of their own time. Now, what was this idea of writing for the future? One could say that it was an attempt, as most cases in history do have, it was an attempt to predict a future. That, looking at the patterns, you find in most of these chronicles, an attempt to trace a pattern in urbanization, in war-torn Germany, or the changes of social fabric. It attempts to understand through them, glean out a pattern, a pattern of change. Which pattern of change can be used as a model for the understanding of, or the interpretation of, or the prediction of what is going to happen in the future. But more importantly, it was also, or there were also, attempts to make and leave for succeeding generations an idea of what happened to us today. What happened to us today so that succeeding generations may be able to understand their past, not our past, their past, that there is a different sense of time here. A sense of time in the sense that it is the chronicle actually treats their own present as a past. As a past that is going to become, as a present that is going to become a past. A past that shall become, come into being when the present passes and the future happens. Strangely indeed, it's a very phenomenological sense of time where the connection between the subject and time, the connection, interaction, interdependability, the intentionality of the subject becomes extremely crucial in the understanding of time and space. So this time is not a static time for them, nor is it, nor is it unflexible. It is a time which is a, past, is, is a future for a past that they have gone through, but will be a past for the future that is going to come up. In a certain manner of speaking, these chroniclers were literally seeing themselves as people who are no more, people who are dead, people who have disappeared from the face of the earth and leaving what one would call a memoir, a record of what they went through for the future generations. Now, if we take this as a model, we realize that this culture of recording the present for the future, not only to predict the future, but also for the future to understand the present, maybe in hopes that they may be able to get lessons from this so that what happened in the present is not repeated. Maybe that they may be able to make better choices. Maybe that they may be able to actually create a different channelization of their creative energies so that a different time is created. Whatever it be, they are invariably lessons, so to speak, for the future. Such attempts have continued even after. And the most interesting thing about that is that these attempts have invariably always happened 
in moments of crisis. As Schmidt says, these have always been written when the subjects of these chronicles or the writers of these chronicles felt themselves, their way of life, and their reality under threat. These were chronicles written under threat, under the, under the, under the shall I say, the, the hanging soul of death, so to speak of passing, of non-existence. This feeling of an external crisis and an internal crisis, a crisis that prompts you to record what you have gone through so that posterity can benefit from it, is a feeling that you find continuing, especially in Europe. I'll give you just three examples of this. And very consciously, all these three examples are taken from a particular point of time, which you will understand, the choice of which you will understand very clearly in terms of its analogy with our own present. Of course, I don't need to mention, really mention the first, the Anne Frank's diary. The diary is written by that little girl, Jewish girl, under the threat of Nazi regime where being cooped up in the, to the small apartment, ready, waiting for that inevitable knock on the door, which only gets postponed each, each minute with the certainty that each minute passing is not in each minute of escape, but it's only another minute closer to that inevitable knock. I don't want to go further into that. But there is another text which I would like to talk about, and which I've talked about in several lectures, because I think probably one of my duties is to get more and more people to read the text. That is Erika Mann's School for Barbarians. Erika Mann is the daughter of Thomas Mann, the famous German novelist. Erika Mann wrote this book while in Germany, and it is about the schooling system of Germany and how the Nazi party and the entire Nazi system clearly brainwashed, ideologized, and appropriated youngsters from the age that they were four or five till the time that they were in their 20s through different kinds of associations, organizations, which were connected to Nazi party. She gives a number of examples. What is interesting about the book is that it is entirely based upon actual, real experiences of people. But especially because of that particular situation in which she was writing and where it was imperative for her to keep confidential the real identities of the people who were involved, she had no choice but to fictionalize them. And in the process of fictionalizing them, she also collated different incidents so that they would become, in a narrative manner of speaking, consummate narratives or complete narratives. One story that she speaks about is about this drummed up confession that happens in front of children. They used to have the Kinder Nazis, the Child Nazi Party, the Youth Nazis, the Girl Nazis, like the Girl Scouts, they had the Girl Nazis, into which these children at different ages would become members. And they were considered to be, these organizations were considered to be equally or more important than schools themselves. One story that she narrates is of a meeting of young people kids, hardly between five and eight years old, and there are the Nazi officials of the city there, and one child comes up to the officials and declares to them, my father is a traitor, and they ask, why? And the kid says, my father has communist literature with him. He holds with him collections of music 
which are considered anti-Nazi. He has texts in literature which are considered anti-Nazi. And he reels off a number of those names. Immediately, the father is brought and the father is denounced. So the son denounces the father. Immediately, the father is arrested and taken away. And the Nazi officials reward this kid with gifts, with coffee, with candy, and more importantly, medals which he wears on his uniform. He is given a promotion within that militarist organization of children from being a lieutenant to the next order, Kada. What happens as a consequence? Children can be the cruelest beings in the world. These children who are sitting there, listening to this, seeing this drama, and mind you, this is only a drama. This is a concocted drama. This is a constructed drama put up there for the consumption of these little kids. A little kid sitting there will also have the desire, I would like to get candy. I would like to be congratulated. I would like to be praised by these great officials. I would also like to get a promotion in my organization. So what he would do next is become a spy in his own home and wait for the first opportunity to denounce his own parents or his own relatives. This is a system where instead of creating spies or using the police or the Gestapo, you effectively have what one would call a domestic police, the children being turned into spies and the Gestapo spying on their parents and their relatives. And children fell into the trap and what and children fell into the trap and what as a result happened was that several families were broken asunder, people were arrested, sent to concentration camps, all under the guise of being anti-Nazi, or if I may use a term which we are more familiar with, of being anti-national. The second anecdote that she gives, again based on a real incident, is that of a young boy celebrating his birthday. He has invited three of his friends to come for the birthday. The birthday party, the cake and everything is ready. The mother and the three, and the son is waiting. Among the three friends invited, two people have come, two kids have come. One person has not come yet. These kids are uncomfortable because the kid who is yet to come is their superior in this children's organization. And if he doesn't come, it means it is a slur. It is some kind of a, shall I say, expression of dissatisfaction. And so they are waiting expectantly. Finally, the doorbell rings and the birthday boy says, I'll get it and goes. And there is, of course, that kid who is a superior, he comes in. But he comes in not like a kid. He comes in like a military officer and asks the mom, where is Carl's father? She says, Carl's father is upstairs. He's working on something. I'd like to see him now. The mother is impressed by the sheer command in this 13-year-old boy's voice. She is in her 30s, and she cannot say no to him because there is this power, this command that he draws from his organization. And he says, I'd like to see his father. So the mother goes up, calls the father. He comes down. He's a bit impatient, not knowing quite well why it is that he has been called down by this 13-year-old kid. And when he arrives, the kid asks, the so-called leader asks him, why did your son not report for the meeting day before yesterday? So the father says, he had a cold and a fever, and so I did not let him go. But then, during daytime, he attended school, didn't he? 
So the father said, yes, I thought he, he shouldn't miss school, so I sent him to school. But because it is the evening, I didn't want him to be out in the cold, and I told him not to go. This is unacceptable. This is inadmissible. If this continues, I will be forced to report you and your son to the higher authorities. Look at the situation. The father stands there, helpless in front of this 13-year-old kid. What really goes on in his mind, as Erika Mann writes, is to take an arm and slap this kid on the face and ask him to get going. But he cannot do that. Why? Because that will invariably invite the wrath of the police in the party, and that will invariably result in his arrest and his deportation. At the same time, he's already worried that the maid who comes into the home is a spy whose husband is a Gestapo man, and she may have already carried tales about the magazines that come here, the books are there that are there in the library. He's already rather insecure. So, out of fear, this 40-year-old man says sorry to the 13-year-old kid and says, I'll make sure that he will be sent to your party meetings. That entire book is a 2D force in the way in which a system was put in place whereby little children from the age of five onwards were systematically ideologized into a very nationalist ideology and turned into automatons for that ideology, where they not only saluted and clicked their heels, but were prepared, getting prepared, to be turned into the killing machines of the concentration camps and which people later on at Nuremberg trials could come back and say without a shade of guilt and say, why did you kill so many people? I was only following orders. As Hannah Arendt puts it, it is the banality of evil at play throughout society, especially from the lowest ages onwards. The third example that I would like to refer to here is a book again, but based upon a series of letters and correspondences that happened between a woman and her friends and the members of her family. It has been compiled together, or it has been collated, collected, and brought out as a book called Between Two Homelands, Letters Across the Borders of Nazi Germany. This is a correspondence, as I said, of Umgrad Goebbelsbleben in the 1920s, who moved from Germany to Netherlands as a result of the shifting of children post the First World War. She went to Netherlands. She happened to fall in love with her uh, as a 13-year-old. But by the time she was 20, she got associated with a Dutch businessman and married him and settled down in Netherlands. But she continued her letters with her brother in Germany, the other family members of Germany, her friends who continued in Germany. So these are a series of letters starting in the late 1928 onwards till the end of the Second World War. What you find there, the letters at the beginning are very sympathetic, warm letters of course, with a note of nostalgia that this 13-year-old who has become 25 or 30 still harbors within her about her homeland, Germany, the time she spent there as a child, even though it was during the First World War. Those memories are there. But slowly as you go through the correspondence, you realize that there are divergences coming up. She is in Netherlands. These people are in Germany. And being in Netherlands, it is possible for her to have an outsider's view of what is going on in Germany, while people in Germany, her friends, her family members, are slowly but steadily getting more and more sympathetic to the political change that is happening in Germany. 
this divergence in political opinion finally culminates in Germany attacking Netherlands and through the war overcoming Netherlands. But through the correspondence, what you also find is a dilemma or the dilemmas of a number of people. The brother, for instance, at first a vociferous critic of the Nazi party, slowly changes the tone, his tone gets changed, till finally it reaches the point where it decides to join the Nazi party and becomes a firm adherent to the Nazi ideology and stops writing to his sister. She gets information about him from her friends and the other members of family. But as the letters go on, the information that comes in from Germany gets thinner and thinner and thinner. It's like the story of a person who got exiled to Siberia, written by Solzhenitsyn, exiled to Siberia, and he told his friend, I will write letters to you, it will be censored, but don't worry. Whenever I write in blue ink, remember that is the truth, and whenever I write in, oh sorry, the other way around, whenever I write in red ink, remember it is truth, and whenever I write in blue ink, remember it is false. So, he writes, and quite contrary to what his friend imagined was the case in Siberia, the entire letter is written in blue ink. Everything is true. It's brilliant here. It's beautiful here. The officers are so nice. The supermarkets are filled with food and everything that you require. Everything is hunky-dory. But at the end, he writes, but unfortunately, red ink is not available. Almost like that, what you find in this case is that the information and a more punctuated kind of narrative about the life in Germany gets thinner and thinner. They seem to be wary of divulging more information. They seem to be wary that their letters may be read in transit. They seem to be alert to the distinct possibility that there would be spying ears and spying eyes looking at what has been written and which would be at their own peril. Now, what those letters really indicate is not a black and white situation, but a process where rampant nationalism, extremist nationalism, slowly but steadily lays siege, not only upon a country, not only upon a society, but upon the minds of a population, and that process of slow mental change. Now, I come to our present time. I'm sure that what I have spoken till now does not need any further extension. It is pretty clear what I'm trying to tell you. But before I reach that, let me also remind you that we have passed through something, a crisis, an extremely severe crisis, during which time, though not consciously, we actually did archiving of an intense kind. During the COVID times, for example, when all of us, in one way or another, were tethered to our homes, locked up in our homes with the oxymoron social distancing. How can you have social distancing? Is it social distancing or it's social distancing? No. If it's social, it cannot be distancing. You can have physical distancing, but the so-called oxymoron of social distancing. Now, what happened during that time? If you just look at the social media, probably the first thing that appears to us as a remarkable feature of those times, and which to some extent still continues today, is that people who never we thought were singers coming out with song, people who never we associated with dance, dancing 
to two lines, catching it on, on video and placing it on, on Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp. All of a sudden, like Mark said, let there be a thousand roses blooming. There were roses blooming everywhere in the form of dancers, singers, exhibiting their artistic talents. The only small flip side to that is that these people could at best maybe sing two lines or one song. Beyond that, it's not a prop, was a possibility. But still, it was a distinct attempt at actually expressing themselves in a time of utter threat where even the question of their survival was seriously under danger. Now, if you look further, you realize that during the COVID times, we actually created a massive archive not just of public documents, not just of documents, governmental instructions, etc., etc., which is all there. But beyond that, there are huge community archives where people corresponded with their, with their fellow beings, with their friends, over WhatsApp, after, over Facebook, over email, etc., through pictures, through photographs, through videos, where the video call became a preferred method of talking to one another. In one sense, it was not conscious. It was created under the pressure of a certain system which, was, which had laid siege upon the general everyday life of people. And this was our method, as the chroniclers of that time did, our method of getting a grip on our reality, trying to make sense of our reality trying to make sense also of our mind and holding onto dear sanity, so to speak. This archive is out there. We have not done anything about it. If only we were to connect just the tip of the iceberg, if you get at least 1% of that huge archive out there, it will be enough to understand what people actually went through. It was a documentation process par excellence in the sense that it was not done by any governmental agency, any official agency, it was done by each and every individual in their own particular way, in their own particular manner, providing us with manifold perspectives on an experiential reality. If that was not conscious, what today I believe we should be doing is a conscious act of archiving our present. And when I say is a conscious act of archiving our present, I say that with a certain sense of gloom in my words. When I said lucky Atike Ramachandran and M. Murali Tharan for having departed earlier, not having to see what is happening in this country, we are the people who are left witnesses to what is happening around us. And let us be sure about one thing. 2024 is going to be the watershed. That will be the point of no return. After 2024, if any of us here have, and I may be called a Cassandra, you know, the doomsday speaker, but this is a fear that I have, that I share with innumerable other people that 2024 will strike the death knell of this democratic country, of this secular country, of a country where there is a parliamentary system despite all its weaknesses and disadvantages. A country where, despite all the inequities and oppressions, it is still possible to dream of self-respect for human beings. That will be put paid to in 2024. And after that, what are we left with? What are we left with? When we look back on history, what we understand is not very heartening, not very gladdening. None of the fascist regimes that had been ruled, that, that have ruled the world over, have been thrown out through internal processes. They have been thrown out as a result of war whether it is the Second World War or subsequent to that, the different kinds of xenophobic 
sectarian regimes that have come up in Eastern Europe, there have been regime changes not as a result of internal revolutions, but primarily as a result of external threat or wars that have broken out. Rueful it would be, horrific it would be, if that is the way that our country is headed to. But one thing is certain, and that is, it is time for us to be conscious of that and create records of what we are going through. Because what we are going through will have to be left for the future. As the chroniclers read, wrote about their own times, not merely in terms of documenting their present, but also in creating documents that can be accessed by the future. In other words, what I am trying to say here, to myself, shall I say, is that it is high time we started to treat our present as the past, if not our past, as the past of succeeding generations, of the past, as a past of the future, and leave our chronicles as a people, a community under threat, writing, facing their graves. Thank you very much. If you, if you have any questions, and we can take uh, one or two questions, if it is there. Ideally, for a memory lecture, there won't be a session like question and answer. There is no answer at all. There is only responses. If you have any one or two questions, you can simply, simply raise it. And um, she, will, she will respond to it. Thank you. Any questions? Which other can or tie on the right side? Uh, uh, thank you, Masha, for uh, uh, a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I had uh, 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 some observations, like uh, you were explaining that uh, uh, the ordinary people uh, write about their experience and archiving their experience. So I had uh, uh, a few queries on that. Uh, when we look at this archiving their experiences, uh, is there any validations and who exactly validates those experiences? Uh, say, for example, in this uh, uh, Kajalia's famous note on this, why I'm not a Hindu, and he actually brings a lot of examples uh, to critique on the Hindu tour, but actually he was uh, very much doubtful that how far it is uh, uh, validating, actually to critique that dominant narratives. Why? Because in this, uh, uh, the dominant discourse always portrays sort of uh, uh, knowledge as validated and certain knowledge as, you know, that uh, uh, quite very subjective and that often, you know, that avoided in the social science discourses. So uh, in that context, I think, uh, I mean, uh, when we archive such kind of uh, a present, uh, can we really uh, represent their experiences or uh, uh, not just for this archiving but actually can we give any sort of validations uh, in our uh, you know that dominant discourses what are the kinds of validation that you have in mind 
how does one validate something as knowledge and invalidate something else as non-knowledge? What are the methodological resources that you use to do that? I'm asking you a question in reverse. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll respond like this way. Uh, uh, suppose uh, if you understand certain experience uh, from the lower sections of the society, the so-called lower or the so-called lower caste, and that often, you know, that uh, those kinds of lived experience when it comes to the academics or uh, when it comes to the dominant discourse, people uh, usually see it as quite empirical and it's not to do with the, I mean, the dominant narratives or cannot do any, produce any certain knowledge. Knowledge is always, it goes with the typical theoretical writings and uh, where we are actually differentiating with this experience. In that sense, I understood that uh, uh, knowledge and experience. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't entirely agree with that. Um, the, the process of validation that you are thinking of in terms of the structures of power and authority within disciplines, uh, those kinds of structures of power are continuously being questioned. The work of someone like Sanal Mohan, for instance, is a great example there where uh, what is being done is to question those very structures of validation themselves and where validation is not seen in terms of conventional systems of validation but validation in terms of the interconnectedness of the different experiences and how they bear testimony one experience bear testimony for another experience how there is a kind of shall I say wholesomeness of picture that comes out of it. I'm not bothered about such validations at this point of time. Uh, I think that is a question that probably later people may have to ask when we are trying to write about the present. I'm not even bothered about the disciplinary questions that some disciplinarians may come up with. I'm only, I'm not bothered with them because those are post-script issues. I am speaking about the issue of scripting an experience. And of course, in scripting that experience, you will be baggaged, you will be bundled, you will be, you will be weighed down upon by the knowledge systems that you are already prey to, that you are already part of. That will be there. That will invariably be there. But despite that, in the act of scripting, there is always the distinct possibility that the act of scripting will subvert those very structures which creates rigid compartmentalizations or regimentations within writing. That is why the writing gets away from the writer and has a life of its own. And it can create meanings that may not be apparent to the writer at the point of writing, but at a much later point of time to another reader who is able to place it in another context and also dwell into or, 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 or uh, dive into the sinews of that writing in such a way as to bring out the hidden layers of meaning. So I'm not really bothered, I'm not really bothered about validation at this point. I uh, am really disturbed listening to you very closely and therefore when uh, Dr. Rajesh uh, wanted me to say something I thought I may not uh, say anything uh, but entirely agreeing with what uh, you have uh, said with this cautionary note with which you ended our present as past of the future uh, which is where actually the problems uh, begin. So I, something which comes to my mind is my couple of visits to uh, Holocaust Archive, uh, Holocaust Museum in Berlin, where you have this, uh, which reminded me when you said, uh, when you said about that, uh, yeah. So 
what you said uh, reminded me of my visit to Holocaust Museum in Berlin. I went there twice. And uh, seeing the kind of exhibits over there, you know, uh, met, uh, scribbles that have survived the time, uh, scribbles which were made on toilet uh, papers and which are fixed on the floor of the museum. And as you pass by, uh, you start hearing uh, the voices uh, which are recorded also. I mean, there is a voiceover for all of that. Uh, so you have this uh, scribbled and crumbed papers coming alive and uh, speaking to us. We are the uh, future for them. Uh, whereas uh, the things written are quite intense and uh, uh, painful, you know, you know, there are references to longing, departures, and all sorts of human emotions, uh, you know, getting repeated over there. And uh, history becomes absolutely live, where uh, validation question that uh, you have responded to, uh, you know, validation doesn't take place the way we think about. So this is an experience which uh, all of us, even as we are uh, far away from that particular Jewish experience, can understand. So the shared humanity is what, at the end of the day, uh, the problem. So I am reading, uh, I forgot this, uh, you know, uh, the full name of the author, Linda. She's a, a Jewish uh, American historian who has collected a lot of narratives of the survivors and then talking about. So I'm reading this in the context of Gaza. See here, you have this uh, from early October, uh, the intense experiences on both sides. And where shall we uh, draw the line of demarcation? So 50 years from now, this uh, present becomes uh, past for the people, not just there, for even for us. So this is the big challenge, I think, uh, we are uh, opening up. And uh, so therefore, what I said, I, got, I was just uh, really uh, stunned when this whole invitation caught uh, our present as past of the future. Future is past, we know. I mean, this thesis. But when we live this uh, through the lives, not just of others, but uh, we live this through our own lives. And I think that is a big challenge that uh, we are uh, going to face. So my children at home tell me that you stop reading all this stuff <laughs> and, uh, you know, and uh, live peacefully. And I don't think, uh, you know, we have uh, that sort of a, a peaceful time. And I carry this uh, burden, as you said, ultimately, that's the burden of, uh, you know, the present. Yeah, so I'm really uh, disturbed. Thank you. Never come to the Palazaratil in Daum. Um, Romila Tapandru Lagano to question or not to question. That is the question. So you may have question, but never have this dilemma. Try to articulate it. I request, uh, I invite um, Joby to extend a formal word of thanks. Hello, uh, <coughs> Namaskaram. Uh, I hope. Uh, uh, all of you enjoyed this uh, fascinating lecture. Uh, it was personally, it was highly, uh, uh, you know, interesting to me uh, to understand certain facts. Actually, uh, Marsh was uh, speaking about like uh, uh, writing future and some of the theme, particularly uh, like the conscious archive. Uh, one has to think more about this uh, conscious archive and. Uh, and semi-private and certain aspects like, you know, writing future. Uh, I think uh, uh, in research and particularly uh, when we do certain examples or when we do writings, uh, those kinds of uh, consciousness has 
can be mentioned or can uh, can be seen in our writings and uh, uh, research. So uh, 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 my formal uh, duty to say thanks to Mash. Uh, actually, uh, uh, on behalf of the School of Social Science uh, faculty and students, uh, we thank you, Mashay, for coming here and uh, delivering a fascinating lecture. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, always, uh, Namada Rajmash, Sanalmash, Krishna Mash, Avru Dunder, Yuru event like Vandadina or Kendarukum School in the Pet Lula, Nandi Arakano. Open the night, but students, but a school in the theatre, but a student, Ningal Vandadilan Nandi. So, eleven thanks. Thank you very much.